Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, Three Things You Need to Know About Document Data Modeling in NoSQL, sponsored by Couchbase. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. If you would like to chat with us or with each other, feel free to pull down the chat icon in the top right corner of your screen for that panel. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Matthew Ravel. Matthew is the lead developer developer advocate at Couchbase in EMEA, where he gr helps to grow the Couchbase community and works to, with developers to build scalable, low-latency backends for their software projects. And with that, I will get turn it over to Matthew to get us started with today's webinar. Hello and welcome. Hello. Thank you very much. Um, great to be here. So, yeah, document database modeling. Um, it's, it's an interesting subject, and it's one that uh, Couchbase we get asked a lot about, and uh, I hope that um, I can share some, some useful things. Uh, and I would say that um, the first thing that it's important to, to get across uh, today is that we are actually still learning. Um, you know, I'd say this current NoSQL phase uh, probably started you know, 2005 when CouchDB was launched. Um, you know, obviously non-relational databases have been around uh, since the first databases because they were indeed non-relational. But you know, we've had Lotus Notes plugging away in the background. We've had all sorts of different types of non-relational databases around. But it, it feels as though, you know, certainly since 2010, um, things have been growing quite a lot for the document-style databases, and so. You know, that's only five years compared to the 40 or so years that we've had to work out what's best to do with relational databases. So when you walk into a bookstore or go on Amazon, you won't see books like these about data modeling for document databases. Uh, there isn't that great wealth of learning, of academic study and, and testing uh, around document database modeling. That's not to say there's none, but it's still early days. And there's still, um, I suppose, the sort of learning we're talking about, the sort of understanding that we're talking about is, is that that's been gained in practical application of, of these databases. Uh, so the title of this talk is a little clickbaity, uh, you know, kind of three things you want, you need to know. Um, and, you know, there, there are more than three things, um, but it all comes down to uh, an initial question of when you know the sorts of questions you're going to ask and where you want the computation to happen. So in the relational world, we always built our, built our applications with the idea that the database management system would be responsible for computing the answers to our questions. We write SQL queries and the answers come back with relatively little effort on the part of the application layer. But with non-relational databases, with no SQL databases, that's changed. Um, partly, that's because the creators of no SQL databases um, were focusing on other other questions. You know, was it scalability that they were focusing on, or was it, um, uh, you know, uptime, availability, that sort of thing. Um, so query was actually, you know, kind of pushed out of the window for a while, and actually the answer to a lot of NoSQL query has been, well, you know, you handle that in the application layer. Um, so that's, that's kind of changing now to an extent, but there's still this, this, this question of where do you want the computation to happen? And that, that depends partly on, on when you know what questions you're going to ask. And these query methods here 
a very couch based specific. But you can take some of the um, some of the the principles from from this and, and apply them more generally to to other document databases. Um, so the first question, or the first criteria is, like I say, when do you know what questions you're going to ask? So in the couch based world, if you have predictable queries and you're happy to have the computation happen in the application layer, then really you can work with key value, the key value method of using couch based, um, and that will give you super fast response times, strongly consistent answers um, across a distributed uh, database. Um, but you're asking the application layer to do all the work of, of actually doing the interesting stuff. So in effect, what you're doing is you're you're uh, pre-computing the answers uh, to your to your questions, and then storing them in the database. Um, then, if you have um, uh, queries that, again at design time of the application, you know you're going to want to ask. Um, but you really want to offload some of that computation to the database layer. Well, with the in the Couchbase world, you would use views, and if you're familiar with CouchDB, then you know again what views are. But essentially, that's um, creating secondary indexes on your JSON data using MapReduce queries. Uh, and there are other things you can do with it other than just creating secondary indexes. But that's that's the primary output really is, is another index on the data that you can query. And then for queries that you don't know you're going to, you know, those known unknowns, I guess, or unknown unknowns maybe, um, for those queries that you don't know you're going to need up front, then in the Caltrix world we have, we have Nickel, um, which is our new uh, SQL-like query language for querying JSON. Um, and that's pretty much, um, that's pretty much, uh, uh, I'd say, the, the future of querying with Couchbase. Uh, in, in that you're going to be able to apply the SQL-like language to huge numbers of, of JSON documents, and we'll look at that a little bit more later. But effectively, yeah, that gives you the ad hoc, ad hoc query that we've been used to with, with relational databases, but in a document database. Okay, so let's start off with looking at, at key value. Um, so the, the principles here and the things I'm going to go through are the idea that when you're storing documents in a document database in a key value fashion, so what do I mean by that? Basically, you have one index, and that is the key that you're storing the document with. So really, the, the, I'm going to go through the idea that instead of treating the database as a, as a great resource of, of, of answers that you, uh, you can piece together whatever you want, Instead, what you're doing is you, 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 you pre-compute answers, store them, and then pull them out when you need them. Uh, the next thing is very similar. You know, you're storing object states. And then there are two questions, two things that you need to work out in order to be as uh, optimal as possible, and that is choosing when to embed data all in one big document and when to refer to other documents um, in much the same way as we would refer to other rows and other tables in a relational database. And then the last thing is you need to design your keys well. So let's have a look at that, pre-computed answers. Um, we're used to asking questions of databases. You know, SQL and the relational model have given us, um, really, they've, they've made us kind of spoilt, really, because, you, you know, you split up your data neatly into uh, these normalized tables and in, in, into rows and so on, and, and that means that you, know, you have a very good, or well, the database has a very good understanding of the shape of the data and lets you ask almost any question of it. Um, and that, that's, that's kind of okay, that's good, that works in many circumstances. But the, the, the trade-off is, is, as we know, one of, one of making scaling easy, of, of making uptime easy as well. Um, and also SQL queries can take quite some time to compute. So we've come up with, with ways of, of, of ameliorating that, such as introducing caching layers to cache the answers to our common queries and so on. Um, but yeah, so the relational world has, has allowed us to think in terms of, well, I'll ask whatever question I want and get the answer back. Um, and a lot of the time, you know, the, the way that we design applications, 
this might not be optimal, but we might um, you know, design our applications in such a way that we're asking the same question over and over again every time we display something. Whereas the document database way of doing things is more like a library of answers. So, you know, you, you, well, there's two things. One is you acknowledge that you might have the same answer in multiple places, but in different contexts. So if we think of a traditional library, um, the theory of evolution, for example, might be, um, might be described in several different books in the library, and that's fine, uh, and you, because you don't expect there just to be one, one version of it. You expect to find it in different contexts. Um, and then the other thing is that, that the context itself is important for how you, how you get to it. So um, in, if we apply this more to those spaces, then what, what's actually happening is that you are, instead of going out and asking the same questions or variations of the question every time, uh, when you come to need the data, instead what you do is you build the data or the answer, you build the answer and then store it as a document. So what do I mean by that? Well, Martin Fowler is someone who um, has written a great deal about, um, about MySQL. And on his website, he talks about the idea of the aggregate-oriented database, or as I call it here, the answer-oriented database. So here we have an example from his website of a, an order form. Now, a paper order form in the real world, in a you know, physical transaction, uh, puts together all the same data for that, that one transaction on the same piece of paper. And then if we come to enter that into a relational database, well, what we do is we split out all of the, the different components of the order form into rows in tables, and we split them out and store them separately. Whereas in the answer-oriented database, we take, we take all that data from the form and we keep it together. So we store together the data that we um, access together. Um, and this, this principle of storing together the data that we access together is, is key to how we model our data in an answer-oriented database or a document database. And going back to that idea of pre-computing answers, um, here is a screenshot from Skyscanner. Um, Skyscanner is a, um, a, an aggregation service which you type in your, your flight requirements and it will go to multiple different travel agents and so on and get you the price. Now, the way that they do that is through a mixture of API calls and screen scraping. And that would get very costly if they did the same set of scraping and API calls every single time that someone wanted a flight from Manchester to San Francisco, for example. So instead what they do is they run the query once and then store the answer as a set of JSON documents in, in Couchbase in this case. Um, and then when someone comes back to find that, uh, to, to, to do that, uh, that journey request again, it simply pulls out the cached version from Couchbase. So it's that idea that they've already computed the answer and then they can supply it very quickly by pulling it, the answer pre-computed out of the database. And so that is one of the key principles is that you, um, you do the work probably asynchronously and then store it and then present it when it's requested. So the human being has to wait only a minimal amount of time. Another example would be, say, with a social network. Um, instead of building the newsfeed every time that someone views it by, you know, doing all the SQL queries and so on to find out what their contacts are doing or what updates they've posted, instead, when someone posts an update, you build asynchronously all the different newsfeeds that are updated, that, sorry, that are affected by that update, and then you sort them as JSON documents and then pull them out with a single query, a single GET request um, when one of the followers wants to view their newsfeed. Okay, so that, that kind of brings us on to the idea of embedding and referring to data. Here we've got um, a very simple uh, kind of e-commerce order represented in a, 
uh, a set of tables. So we have the order details here. They um, are linked to the master order record there. And then we see that customer number 40, well, there's customer mm -hmm. number 40's details. And we're actually ordering product item number one. And there is product item number one up in the top left. So quite familiar with that. And obviously that's denormalized. That's, uh, sorry, that's normalized. We, we have references or joins to each part of the data. And we don't duplicate data. Um, and you know that doing so would be a sin. Whereas in a JSON document database, uh, it's, it, it's quite okay to have a single document that represents all of that. So here we have the customer's details, including the address and so on. We have all of the product details, and we have everything that we need for that order in one JSON document. And so that's a heavily denormalized and an embedded document um, version of, of, of that order. And that's okay, that's one way of doing it. Uh, but we could also still continue to split out data and have canonical copies of particular records rather than duplicating that data across the database. So let's see that again. So here we have just the one order document because we don't need to normalize. So it's okay for us to embed um, an object here in our order data so we could have, you know, multiple uh, lines here. Um, multiple items represented here, but so that's fine. Um, so we, we lose one of our embedded things from the relational version, um, but we're still pointing out to other documents. So here we have our customer ID 40. So we have our customer, we have a, 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 a canonical record for this customer that we're linking to. Um, then we have a canonical record for our, our, our item or product number one. And we're not duplicating that across the database. So, you know, very simple stuff. You know, we're, we're in one we're embedding, in the other we're referring. So when should you embed data? Well, largely, it's a mixture of two questions. Is, your, is the speed of access the most important thing for you? Because if it is, then clearly, depending on document size, but clearly um, the embedding data in one document is going to be quicker than doing a few different lookups uh, to retrieve, say, three or four documents to get the same data back. And the other one is how is the ratio of writes to reads? So if you have a very heavy read workload on that data, then maybe a, an embedded document uh, is, is the best way to go um, because you are, if you're mostly reading the data, then you avoid one of the problems of referring to the data, and that is that the data um, uh, is, is, is the idea of you know not having transactions in a in a uh, in most non-relational databases. Uh, so you know if you want to do an update to that data that affects multiple documents, well. You know, if it goes wrong halfway through, then you've got to handle that in the application layer. Most non-relational databases won't help you with that. Uh, and then, so the other thing is, you know, you should embed data when you really don't want to duplicate data. Uh, sorry, when you're happy with duplicating data. That's an error on the slide, sorry. Um, and like I say, when the application layer is capable of keeping all the multiple uh, copies of that data in, in sync. So. If the address for the customer is copied across all of the order documents that, that, uh, that represent the orders that that person has made, and then they want to update the address uh, in their open orders to change where they're going to go to, then in the application layer, you need to be the one who is deciding or making sure that that update across multiple documents goes well. So when should you refer to data? Um, well, basically, there, there are two main cases. And, and in the CalFace world, we, we suggest that you, uh, you, you refer to data as often as possible. And I'll, I'll explain why in a moment. But one of the reasons is that referring to data gives you consistency of data. So if there's, you know, it's, again, it's not rocket science, but if there's only one copy of the customer record and that is updated in one place, then that data, that update, will be reflected in every place that you refer to it. 
And the other case is where your data has large growth potential. So if your document database is, say, uh, recording instant messaging conversations, the conversation between two individuals could, you know, span many years and, and, and become uh, quite enormous. Uh, so you might want to, rather than uh, embed all of that conversation data in one document, you might prefer to perhaps paginate by day and then have a master document that links out to all of the, the sub-documents that, that, that uh, count, account for each day. Um, so why do I say, you know, that you should, uh, t that we tend to recommend to refer to data in the country's world? Well, it's, it's primarily about the, the uh, nature of Couchbase itself, because Couchbase has um, an integrated memcached layer. Uh, anything that's in your working set, you know, that's, that's, that's basically um, uh, your, 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 your go-to data uh, is in RAM. So you're talking about sub-millisecond response times, both for, certainly for writes and for reads of any data that's, that's, in your, that's in your cache. So if you size your RAM appropriately, then you can get some, some very fast response times from Couchbase. And so if it takes, you know, uh, I don't know, one and a half uh, milliseconds to, to read two documents, or, you know, two milliseconds to read three or four documents, um, that's, that's not really a great cost when you consider that on a, you know, a, a spinning disk, you know, just, just doing a disk seek could, could take that much time uh, for, for the disk seeks for your, for your SQL query if, you, if you're in a relational database. So, you know, we, we tend to say refer where you can because that will ensure great consistency of your data. Okay, so that brings us on to key design. Uh, so when we're dealing with key value data, the key is absolutely the most important thing you have because if you cannot recreate that key again, then you, you'll have trouble finding your, your data. Now with most document databases, um, Cashbase included, there are other ways to get to it. So you, you, know, you could build a view, for example, to find your data. You could do a nickel query with Cashbase to, to find that data again. But if you're sticking to a pure key value model, then the way you design the key is, is absolutely important. And there are, there, you know, there are three broad types of key that, that we tend to see. Um, one is something that's deterministic uh, from data that you already have. So imagine that you're uh, creating a user profile uh, and it's for a, a website where the users log in using their email address. Well, at the point of logging, you, you have their email address. So that's something you have about that, that person that you can then, you could then key their user profile using that. So you can just look up the email address and then you have a route into all of that person's data. Another way would be some kind of random or computer generated uh, key. And then there are compound keys. So um, these can be either a deterministic portion with some semantic loading onto it, or it could be a UID that has a deterministic portion or, or whatever. So we'll, we'll look at that in a, in a moment and go into more detail. So here we have a user profile um, modeled as a, as a Java class. And there's a JSON equivalent. So, we key it using the email address. That's great. Like I say, that means that when I log in now with my Matthew at couchbase.com email address, we can do a simple lookup on that key and get my user profile back. Brilliant. But what happens then when I want to change my email address? Uh, well, there are a couple of things we can do. We could um, create an entirely new document that's keyed by the new email address and then destroy the old one. But maybe that feels a bit messy, it doesn't feel quite right, and, um, you know, it, it, it could leave uh, a trail where, you know, we could have some orphan documents perhaps because the delete didn't happen quite correctly in the application layer. Um, so, you know, what else could we do? Well, we could perhaps do a lookup document where now Matthew at Couchbase.com simply points over to the next um, uh the, the new document, the new user profile. 
there are a couple of things we could do, but both, you know, maybe they're a bit messy, I don't know. What we could do instead is we could remove the, uh, the, the, the loading on the key and we could completely separate the key from that, that email address. So now we, you know, we've got some kind of computer generated key and the email address itself has moved into the document. That's great, I can now change my email address whenever I like. But it also means that if the key is 1001, that we have this issue that now, how do we find that person's data doing a key lookup? Because they log in with the email address and the email address no longer corresponds to the key. Um, well, we, we could make them log in with whatever key name we've got. You know, we could say, right, your user ID is now 1001. But that doesn't, that doesn't seem very fair. Um, so instead, we, we could come up with something else. And the way that we would do that in Couchbase is we would use a, basically a manual secondary index, uh, a lookup document. And so in this case, we, the, the, the path that we'd follow is when you create a new user profile, um, you would use an atomic counter in Couchbase. So you'd set an increment to that, that particular key that would then give you back the next number and that would then load it into your user ID. And then you add, so that might be 1001. And you would add a new document keyed by that number that you get back. And the number has no meaning, it doesn't matter, you know, it's just a, it's just a number. And then you'd save your user profile data keyed by that number. But then the important next step is that you then create another document that is keyed by the email address and its value is simply the number that you use to key the user profile. So if you do a get on the email address, then that will return 1001, and then you can do a get on 1001, and that will give you the user profile document back. Again, none of this is rocket science. You know, this is all quite simple stuff that, you know, people have been putting into practice. Um, and I'm sure that once there's more academic study on this type of thing, then you know this will look quite quite naive, but it works. It works in practice. Um, and you know we we see in the wild uh, people with multiple lookup documents. So you might have a single uh, you know a single document that's keyed, like I say, by some number, but you might then have multiple email addresses that the person might have associated with them. So you can have multiple documents that are keyed by the email address and then the value is just the 1001 key of the, of the document. You might have some kind of Twitter API ID or a Netflix ID or a, a, a username that they might use somewhere. You know, it could be anything you want. And uh, something to point out here is that in the Couchbase world, um, certainly, uh, people tend to use um, key prefixes to denote the content and the type of the data that's stored in the document. So here we've got U colon colon, that means that we have, you know, user profile data in, in that document. And FB colon colon means that it's gonna be, uh, that the rest of the key denotes some kind of uh, Facebook API token or something. Um, and so what we do is we're, we're semantically loading the key so that you can find that. Um, now, in other databases, you might you might use collections or something similar to uh, to um, to denote or to put together types of data like this. Um, but in the Couchbase world, our nearest school is a bucket, and a bucket you know we a bucket is more of a uh, an allocation of resources uh, than it is a, a semantic grouping or a namespacing. Um, so we tend to namespace keys in this way. So yeah, compound keys are lookup documents with predictable names. Uh, so just as we saw there, you know, something like a, an FB colon colon and so on. And this is really uh, putting into practice that idea of referring to data by using uh, a, 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 a lookup document as a manual secondary index. Okay, so here we have uh, my user profile again. And we, we could, if it was an e-commerce system, we might be tracking the various things that, that a user has looked at. Um, 
One way to do that would be to load that into the user profile. But like I said, it's a good idea to avoid having potentially unbounded data loaded into another document. And the, the list of products that I look at could get quite large. So what we could do instead is we could have a products viewed document that, that simply has an array in of the various products that I've looked at. And so what we're doing is we're building up our key. So our key is you, colon, colon, then the user profile ID, which like we said is a random number, then colon, colon, and then products viewed. So we semantically load the key name to tell us what's in the document. And similarly, you know, product date. You know, P colon colon H will give us product date. We'll do a lookup on that. And then we might decide to put the image URL into a another document again by appending colon colon IMG onto the end of the products key name. And so building up our keys like this means that it's it's easier to then reason about what the key name might be when we want to come back later on and find find that 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 data. Okay, so that was key value. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the other ways in Couchbase of of indexing and querying data. Uh, so this is you know this is quite new for not only for Couchbase um, but for for NoSQL in general. Like I say, um, a lot of NoSQL has is kind of put query to one side. I know not everyone has, but certainly those databases that were focusing mostly on 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 scale and and uptime and availability, you know, query became kind of a secondary concern. Um, so this is something quite different for for document databases or at least scalable document databases. But it's okay, you'll find yourself quite at home because we're dealing in um, fairly fairly familiar concepts here. Uh, so uh, the two ways that we have of generating these additional queries in, in the Couchbase world are, like I said at the beginning, there's NICL, which uh, stands for non-first form uh, query language, uh, sorry, non-first normal form query language. And that refers to uh, the first normal form uh, which uh, you know says that basically uh, the data that you you put into a cell in a relational database has to be just one item of data. You can't have nested data. Um, and obviously the you know documents are all about nested data. So we wanted to come up with a query language that that was similar to SQL, and in fact basically is SQL, but with additional functionality that lets you deal with that nested nature of JSON documents. And then the other way is, again, as I mentioned earlier, views. And views are um, uh, something that's been around in, in the Couch family for quite a long time, um, starting off with CouchDB and then coming into Couchbase. And those are map reduced queries that you write in JavaScript. Most people just write map queries, but you know you can write re the reduce side as well. And they allow you to emit indexes based on the content of JSON documents. So a very simple one might be if you have a group of people, you could emit every, you know, you can emit the key of every document from that list of people where the city equals Paris or something like that. Um, so that gives you um, instead of manual secondary indexes, it gives you a series of, sorry, a, a way of creating um, uh, uh, automatically generated secondary indexes. Um, and so now that we have these two ways of, of, of doing more interesting queries with Couchbase, I say now, um, Nickel is in beta right now. Um, Couchbase 4.0, which will come with Nickel, uh, is out later this year. But anyway, now that they're in the Couchbase world, there are these two different uh, interesting ways of querying data. It's, it's useful to come up with some, some ideas for when to use which type. Um, so as I kind of hinted at in the beginning, uh, Nickel is really, we think, the, 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 the future of Couchbase. It's, it's, it's really the way that you're going to do most of your querying. 
Um, but that doesn't mean that peak value and views are out of the window, not by any means. Um, but Nickel has this, this ability to do ad hoc querying on JSON data that you just don't get from key value lookups, um, at least not on the database layer, um, or from views. So we would say, you know, if you're doing ad hoc querying, then Nickel is probably the way you want to go. Whereas if, perhaps if you have predictable queries where you, you know you want to emit certain, uh, an index on certain data, then, you know, a view might be the thing to do because you're not so much querying data, you're just creating another index view to query. Um, and then bringing in the reduce side of the map reduce, uh, views are really great when you want to do some number crunching. So uh, one of the one of the sample data sets that, that ships with catch bases a set of beers and brewers. And so, you know, you can very quickly write a, a, a function that will let you uh, emit um, uh, the, the breweries, a list of breweries uh, in order of the maximum ABV of their beers or something like that, or do a reduce that would let you um, sum up all of the ABVs for a brewery and then list the, the, um, the, brewer, the breweries uh, in order of, of the total ABVs or something like that, you know. Um, whereas, you know, nickel, uh, so whereas views are good at the number crunching side, nickel is more about dealing with, with uh, I, I suppose textual data, you know, so the stuff that you find in JSON. So, um, and it, particularly for that nested JSON data. So, you know, you could have an, an object with, that has several arrays, which then have other data, you know, inside them um, going all the way down. And JSON makes it easy to go into those layers and then pull out what you, what you want from them and mix the results together with, with other data from other, from other documents. Um, and then just a quick note about more on the ops side rather than, than the development side is um, the way that Nickel and Views work is, you know, Views are basically, it's that typical MapReduce thing where you, the, the, the cluster sends out the work to all of the, the, the servers and basically the, where the data exists is where that particular, um, you know, the index runs across those and then parcels it back together. Uh, whereas Nickel, uh, we see, you know, more that if you have very large clusters, you might end up uh, running indexing and query services um, as separate servers from the data server. And so that lets you, you know, basically grow your cluster according to the the nature of your um, the, the nature of, of of your usage of it. Anyway, that's that's like I said, that's more on the upside than the, the development side. So with Nickel, there are a few things to keep in mind: um, indexes, um, types manually stating types, and then key spaces, which basically means joins. Okay, so within with indexes, um, Nickel uh, relies on an index clearly. Um, so you always need at least one index, as you would with traditional SQL. Um, so you create your index, and then anything else you do is the equivalent of a full table scan, until you create secondary indexes. Um, so you know you can test things out, and then once you understand where you're going, you can create the indexes, the additional indexes on on the data. Um, in your JSON documents that allows you to uh, then query things much, much, much quicker. And perhaps the difference, the, the key difference with nickel indexes and SQL indexes is that a, a nickel index won't cause you trouble if one of the documents doesn't happen to have that particular key value pair. It'll just ignore that document. And clearly that's, that's really important with, with uh, uh, flexible schema JSON documents. And there are two different types of, of index in Couchbase for Nickel. We see views there, like I say, you know, views are just a way of generating, or are at the very most basic, a way of generating a secondary index. And then we have a new type of index, global secondary indexes, um, which are, like I say, run on a separate indexing service, which can coexist with the data service. So, you know, every single server in your cluster could still look 
the same as every other one in terms of functionality, or you can split them out if you choose. Um, so when do you when do you use GSI and when do you use views? Um, I think basically, you know, GSI global secondary indexes will be the main way that people use um, create secondary indexes in Couchbase. Um, but uh, the you know views have um, something that, that GSIs don't, and that's support for multi-dimensional geospatial queries. Um, so views are, are not dead by any means. Um, in fact, we're we're doing much more with them than ever. Um, like I say, geospatial and multi-dimensional being 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 part of that. Um, so probably it's not that interesting to go into the detail right now of which type of index you would use, but it's just something to bear in mind when working with nickel. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I'm particularly fond of with nickel is you can do joins across JSON documents. Um, so basically, you know, you, you include um, a foreign, uh, you know, the, the key name of a document in another document, and then you can write effectively the SQL that says, you know, give me um, all of the airlines that do this particular route, or give me all of the routes from this particular airline, doing a join as you would with SQL. And we work across key spaces rather than tables, um, and also within key spaces. So you can do a join across documents inside the same bucket or key space, or across multiple buckets or key spaces. And the reason that there's that difference in terminology between key spaces and buckets is that key spaces could come to mean something else later on. It's just kind of future-proofing the language. Um, and something, yeah, that I mentioned, you know, earlier, uh, is it's really important to, uh, that we go back now to offloading computation to the database layer, you know, rather than constantly asking the application layer to handle that. Um, so Nickel allows you to, um, to do a lot of the, the, the data work on on the, the, the Couchbase cluster level now. You know, a lot of the, the, the hard work that you would have had to have done by hand effectively in the application layer now happens on on the um, on, on the database layer. Okay, so that's pretty pretty much the, the, the sorts of things that we found at Couchbase in terms of, of data modeling. Now those are the basics. Um, if you go to blog.cashbase.com, you'll see, you know, some great articles on modeling, you know, like a user profile store and, and different types of, of, of scenarios. Um, but yeah, um, I'd love to, to have some questions and uh, thanks, for, thanks for listening so far. Matthew, thank you so much for this great presentation. Um, we have some questions coming in, uh, certainly, and if you have questions for Matthew, you want to ask them, submit them in the bottom right-hand corner in the Q&A section of your screen. And, of course, one of the most common questions we get is a question of whether people will get a copy of the slides and the recording. And I will send a follow-up email out to everyone with exactly that and anything else requested throughout the webinar by end of day Thursday. So let's just jump right into it. Uh, Matt, the, Matthew, the first question coming through is, would you recommend papers and books expounding on what you outline in slides 16 and 17 via number one, the map, and number two, the usage pattern to help data store design? Um, I, so I'll, I'll be quite upfront and say nothing comes to mind immediately um, in terms of, you know, real formal learning. Um, but there are certainly some, some great blog posts out there. There are... Um, you know, if, if we talk more generally than Couchbase, then certainly there are books written for other document databases that go into some of this, um, and then there are some new Couchbase books as well that go into um, modeling data. So really, I, I think the most interesting stuff is is, is published on blogs right now, um, certainly on our Couchbase blog, but also, you know, people using all sorts of document databases are are writing interesting stuff and giving interesting talks at conferences about how to do this stuff. And um, I'm quite sure that there are people working on the more academic end, but um, I haven't seen anything myself lately. 
Uh, thank you very much. And you know, you know, we've recently sent out a survey on that particular question and topic, and and I would have to agree with you, Matthew, that blogs are are most certainly been the number one resource for people on this topic. Um, the next question coming in is the ability to do joins across buckets. Something. It, let me restart that. Is the ability to do joins across buckets something that is only available in Couchbase? For example, can joins uh, across collections be done in other databases as well? Um, well, joins in the, the you know kind of the, the SQL type of of, of join um, where you're using effectively just SQL is, as far as I know, something that only Couchbase does right now. Um, certainly there are ways of querying other document databases that, that might, you know, with some work on the application layer, give you an equivalent result, but probably not with the same level of familiarity as you would get from, effect, you know, just writing SQL that happens to have some tweaks to handle JSON. Sure. Uh, and it, going back to the to the blog site you mentioned for Couchbase, it's blogs.couchbase.com, is what is that what you said? Blogs.couchbase.com, yeah. Okay, I'll make sure to put that in the follow-up email as well. There's another request for, for that reference. Um, specific to Couchbase, will N1QL come to Couchbase Lite? Um, I hope so. Um, I, I certainly think that's, that's a longer term aim. So at the moment, um, primarily with Couchbase Lite, you're doing um, you know the, the map produce view type of, of querying. I know that on the on the iOS side of things, um, you know it, we kind of we've, we've, we've certainly built in the the iOS query model where you're able to query some of the data in in, in that kind of way, um, and that's that's something that that we're we're working on bringing better query to the Android version and Xamarin versions as well. Um, but certainly, you know. Our plan is that the nickel should be everywhere that you see Couchbase, and so within time, nickel will come to Couchbase. Like, but I, I'm going to have to, you know, say that I, I don't know when that will happen. Um, only that I, I hope it's, you know, I hope it's soon. Perfect. So another question specific to Couchbase: Is this designed to run on commodity hardware? Yes, yeah, um, so pretty much the entire, I, I think we'd have to leave our NoSQL uh, membership badge at the door if, if, if we said it wasn't. Um, you know, I, I, I can't really think of any major deployments of Couchbase that are on anything other than commodity hardware or in EC2, you know, we, or, or Microsoft Azure, or, um, you know, we have people running it in joints in places like that, so, um, you know, uh, to, to, to borrow a, a phrase, you know, it, it's like the, the pets versus cattle thing. Um, it's very much a case of you treat your couch-based server nodes almost as cattle because if, if one goes away, hey, it, it's all right, you know, they're, they're, they're around us. Um, so, yeah, it's designed very much to run on commodity hardware or in unreliable uh, cloud hosting services, uh, yeah. So, and kind of going back to a couple of the other questions, Matthew, is how efficient are joins in N1QL? That's, that's a really great question. Um, it remains to be seen. Um, I know that's a bit of a cop-out, but um, part of what's happening between now and the general availability of, of, of Nickel and Caltrace 4 is, is that, um, you know, we're, we're, we're in we're working on on improving the efficiency of, of, of the query engine, and uh, we're already you know we're already pretty happy with with how it is. Um, but the other reason I can't really answer that is because right now um, I think DirectTV are the only people running Nickel in production, and that's using the, the beta version. And that's that's something they spoke about at Couchbase Connect uh, conference um, last month. Uh, where there some of the uh, queries in the sort of, if you watch this, you might also like this program type of query that they're doing their, uh, their EPG is happening with Nickel. Um, so it's hard to say how efficient it is, but certainly that is the, our, our primary aim. 
uh, because Couchbase has got a reputation for being really fast, and we don't want to lose that um, by having an inefficient query engine. Um, so watch this space, I guess, is the answer. <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, I love all these questions coming in specifically um, to N1QL. Uh, for N1QL, do you separately define the indexes before you execute the query? Yes, but you don't have to. So, like I said, if you don't define the query, then you're doing the equivalent of a full table scan, which, you know, if you've got millions of documents, probably isn't going to be efficient, but it'll give you a feeling for what the answer would, well, it'll give you the answer, and then you can build the, 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 the indexes um, for that. So, you only ever need an index on the primary keys, and it can do any query you want, but if you want them to be efficient, you'll need to build those secondary indexes. All right, and so again, continuing on along those lines, is it better to embed an array of foreign keys within a document to re refer to other documents, or is it better to have a foreign key in the other documents that are queried against? I'm thinking of a traditional many-to-many -many relationship where you might have a special join table used to link tables. Um, it, it, so that, that sort of question is, um, the, the sort that we generally answer with, uh, well, would you like to hear about our consulting uh, uh, facilities? But no, seriously, um, look, uh, it, it really depends on, 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 the, on the use case itself. But generally speaking, I would say that embedding foreign keys within a document is, is, is probably okay because, um, yeah, I mean, it does depend on, on, on the use case and the data model. Um, what I would say is you would probably embed both ways if you are if you want absolute query flexibility. Um, but yeah, there, there's not much penalty for that either because um, you know you're talking about tiny uh, tiny documents as a result and you're not going to slow down indexing or anything like that if you're doing pure KV. Um, so there isn't really any additional pain other than you have to handle it in your application layer. Um, so I'm going to kind of cop out and say that I don't really have time or the insight of the particular data model to go into it anymore right now. So uh, another uh, uh, N1QL question is, will there be support for that in Couchbase Lite, do you think? Um, I think we might have covered that earlier. but. Um, the, yeah, it, it, I hope so. I hope, I hope we do get to that. Um, I mean, the answer is yes, and what, the reason I say I hope so is just because we don't have a definite roadmap date for it just now. Um, but, um, yeah, clearly, you know, the, the, the processing power of a, a mobile phone and, or, or a, a small embedded device is somewhat different. Um, so, you know, we're, we're kind of looking right now at the best way to, to get query or sophisticated query into Couchbase Lite, and Nico will, I'm sure, be part of that, that story. Love it. I love all the the, the insight into the into what's coming. Um, so, where does Couchbase fit into Cap Theorem? Aha. Uh -huh. Well, we're we're strongly consistent, so we you know we favor C P over A P. Um, so there's a single master. Oh, sorry, single active copy of each record, and then there are replicas waiting in the wings. Um, you do all your writes and reads with that one active record. I mean, you can do replica reads if you want with the caveat that it, they might be out of sync. Um, but certainly for KB, it's strongly consistent within a cluster. And, you know, that's a trade-off that, that's the right trade-off for some people, and for other use cases, availability might be what you're looking for. Um, but generally speaking, Availability isn't a problem with Couchbase, you know, but we do favor CP. Interesting. Uh, and, and kind of, um, so uh, back to the kind of a, uh, modeling questions along that lines, are you, are any of your clients actually modeling the documents, the key indexes and fields ahead of time, or is it more ad hoc? Um, I'd say that a large portion of, of what we do as Couchbase working with customers on the development side is, 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 work, is working with them to work out those data models. Um, I'd say that if, you, if you're kind of 
coming up with your your key naming and so on and uh, in an ad hoc fashion, then you'll you'll pay the price for it later on. Um, uh, so certainly, if you want to have an efficient application layer that's accessing the data, you want to use the the database itself efficiently. Then it's it it certainly pays to spend a few days in front of a whiteboard working out what's going on. Sure, that certainly makes sense. I then I don't see any other questions coming through. We'll go ahead and type any in if you guys have any more questions. And so, Matthew, before we um, close it up, though, what's the n number one question, the mo number one modeling issue um, that you see from your your clients that uh, that maybe we haven't addressed yet so far? I, I, I it, it's I think it's the um, just. Getting that idea, well, there's two things. One is is the, the sheer simplicity of it, which also means that it's really, um, you know, it's enough for it to hang yourself type of situation. Um, so there's that. And, and things like having to manually um, put in a, a key value pair in your JSON document that says what type of document this is. Because then if you're then doing uh, you know, you could then do a, a query of, in, in Nickel or with a view that says emit all of the documents that have typed user profile, you know. And the other thing is is um, schema, schema, uh, 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 what's the word, schema, um, basically, <laughs> I've completely forgotten the English word I'm looking for, but it's, it's uh, having, recording in the document the schema, uh, uh, number or something like that, you know, so you might start, you know, schema number one might be your first one at versioning, that's it. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and then, you know, when you create a new schema type, uh, you would, uh, that would be schema version number two. And so it's really important to record in your documents what schema version they're using, because there's no other way of telling. But then what, if you do record that data, then you can say, well, give me all of the um, documents that are of schema type less than the current schema version, and then I can go through some process in the application layer of, of updating them. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, that, and that's perfect. That actually prompted a couple more questions, which I think we have time for. To, um, so just uh, one question specifically is, um, what is the speed of the views uh, pre-computed document results, specifically this person is interested in the latency? Um, yeah. And then also a separate question, and maybe we can get, well, let's answer that question first, and then I'll get to the other question if we have time. Okay. Well, um, views in Couchbase are, and, and indexing generally are both deliberately eventually consistent. Um, so they run at a slight lag behind the, the key value view of, of Couchbase. Um, and the reason for that is because we don't want to hold up the entire cluster by saying, well, before you write this, um, uh, then, you know, we need to then update the, 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 the views and the indexing and so on, um, because then we'd end up in a slightly less than partition tolerant um, database situation. So generally speaking, you know, the default, and this is the default, is that the, the view index is run every five seconds or every 5,000 writes. Uh, but that's, that's, that's variable, you know, you can change that. And also, you can, at the time of reading that index, you can say, well, I'm happy to have a stale index, or, you know, whatever it, it state is in right now, or please run the indexer again before giving me the result. I mean, you pay a slight penalty, um, but the actual latency, the actual hit that you're taking, um, depends very much on, on the size of your data set and the CPU power of, of your servers and, and the size of your cluster. Um, so again, it's a bit of a, you know, how big is this, how long is a piece of string uh, uh, sort of situation, but um, it certainly does run a slight lag from, from truth, if you like. Matthew, thank you. We do have one more question. If you have a quick answer to what are your suggestions on sharding approach for Couchbase? Uh, my suggestion is don't worry about it. Um, Couchbase handles the sharding automatically, so it does a CLC32 hash on your bucket and key name, and then the cluster itself is a, a huge hash space, 
and that, that you know, the hash number that comes out at the end of the CRC32 process determines where in the cluster it lives. Um, so you know, that's one of the beauties of it. You don't have to worry about it. <laughs> that's a very short answer indeed. That's perfect. <laughs> Matthew, thank you so much for this presentation today. And and for the Q&A, um, just to remind everyone, we will be posting the recording of the webinar and slides to dataversity.net within two business days, and I will send an email out to everybody with all of that information. Um, and, and thanks to Couchbase for sponsoring today's webinar. Always great to have you guys uh, join us. Um, and I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks to our attendees for all the great questions. We just love the engagement as always. So, Matthew, thank you again so much, and especially um, joining us from the UK. I know it's late in the evening for you. So I really appreciate your time. That's fun. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.